Welcome to Farming for Health, where Farmer Lee Jones and I talk with leaders in food, farming, and health and wellness to spread knowledge and inspire a plant-forward future, starting now. Welcome to the Farming for Health podcast. I'm Dr. Amy Sapola, and today I'm joined by chef and Dr. Stephanie White. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm super excited. Yeah. So I can't wait to ask you all about what you're doing at Escoffier. Um, But first, I wanted to just start off with how did you become a chef? And I want to hear about your graduate work as well. Yeah. So, um, you know, they're looking back on my life thus far. You know, there are definitely little pockets when I was a kid. I was super into food. My mom's a big foodie. Uh, My dad, not so much. And I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and my grandmother cooked a lot. But uh, post-depression era foods. You know, it wasn't exactly the thing you looked forward to. I remember eating croutons out of the box as a, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, um, so, so uh, it's a fun food memory nonetheless. But, you know, she's not a great cook, but food was always around in my life. Uh, uh, my grandmother, my grandfather, you know, grew raspberries and pussy willows. Uh, not that those are edible, but we used to harvest them and sell them on the side of the road. And I remember that being a big part of my life. And the connection I had with my grandparents through that. So, you know, that was sort of always an underlying tone for me. And um, the connections I had with my mom were usually through food too. She, growing up, I was, uh, when I was super little, she was an ER nurse and then became an APRN. So she was always super busy. My dad was a firefighter. So, you know, big, busy, you know, doing their thing. So whenever they had time, it was usually around food, you know, so, um, she and I used to check out restaurants together. My first big food memory uh, was actually this carrot cake from this place called It's Only Natural, which is uh, in Connecticut. I think they're still there. It's been a long time since I checked in on them. But um, ironically, they are um, mostly vegan. Uh, and I had no idea in the early 2000s, late 90s that they were that, like that was a thing when I was five years old. It was just really good carrot cake. So uh, food for me was always something that connected me to the people that I cared about in my life. Um, and that was an underlying tone too, for why I became a chef is because food connects us all. And, uh, there's, there's a lot of things you can do in life that connect you to other people, but there's something very visceral about food and the meaning it holds for all of us. So, uh, I wanted to, you know, impact other people through food. Um, you know, growing up too, I became, I, and I know you've, you've talked about this with some other folks on your podcast. I uh, was really interested in food from a perspective of the standard American diet and getting kind of mad and angry at the world as teenagers do. And um, I actually went vegan off of a bet, which is kind of a funny side story. But it was also fueled by the fact that I was already starting to look and critique at where we're at with our food system and being very upset and not knowing what else to do besides voting with food. Um, but it, you know, it spiraled, uh, which is something that I don't really talk about very frequently with other people, but I, I think it was something that um, we may resonate on. Yeah. And, you know, for me initially it was like, oh, I feel so great being vegetarian and vegan. And, you know, I, I was doing ultimate Frisbee and very active and I just felt so much better. And then I kept pushing it and pushing it. And you know that spiral where you hit a point where you're like, I keep, this is not sustainable. I have mm-hmm. beaten my body into the ground and I'm not eating enough because uh, it becomes that restrictive cycle of wanting to continuously be better and better and better. And um, when food becomes freeing, but then it becomes so constrictive, it then controls your life rather than the other way around. So um, for me, rekindling my relationship with food was uh, also a really important part of my identity. Uh, and I think that's why I then leaned heavily into cooking for others because it meant so much to me and my health. So. Oh my gosh. I love your story and your journey. <laughs> oh. And I'd love to dive a little bit more into, because yeah. I totally resonate with you on that. <laughs> and I think um, I'd love to dive more into like reconnecting with food after mm-hmm. you get to the point where you're very, you know, restricted or trying to do everything like perfect Perfect. and kind of scared of a lot of things. How do you like reconnect with food? Yeah. You know, uh, 
right at the time when I had realized, oh, shoot, I've dug myself a deep hole and I can't get out of this by myself. Um, I had actually taken a semester away in high school um, to work or it was a work and learn type of environment. Mm -hmm. It's called Maine Coast Semester these days. Um, and it was mainly focused on ecology, but um, the really cool thing is that all of uh, the cohort, we had farm chores because there's an organic farm attached oh, to cool. the campus. So uh, my cabin mates and I had uh, chicken duty. So we would move the, the chicken homes around every morning to rotate it on the ground so that they were you know, always in a clean spot. Uh, and then I always uh, volunteered for chores like uh, harvesting the sweet potatoes and just having that connection to the earth in that way. Uh, and then the other opportunities I had there was helping volunteer in the kitchen uh, mm -hmm. and their chef, Chef Bill, who unfortunately has passed away since then, but he was a super big influence in my life and uh, thinking through, you know, that the structure that kitchens can have and uh, the vibrancy of literally vegetables that were either just harvested or are in the root cellar that we harvested earlier. So, uh, that's really a big part of my healing journey was uh, getting to experience both the farm, but then also be able to create food for my other cohort members. So um, oh. for me, that was a big part of it was learning to be okay around food mm -hmm. uh, and learning that it didn't need to control me. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's not an easy, not an no. easy journey. Yeah. No. And that's no, sometimes for anyone. it sounds like, <laughs> oh, I just decided. But it's like, no, there's a lot that goes into that. Oh, so. yeah. And there's also, you may already recognize that it's a problem, but getting to the point where you can let go is mm -hmm. so difficult for most people in many different ways. Um, so, yeah, that, that was a huge journey for sure. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you for sharing that. That's, yeah. yeah I think that's going to help a lot of people, really. I, and we all have our own struggles right around mm -hmm. food and I think sometimes it goes um almost unnoticed because mm -hmm. there is such a like nationally unhealthy relationship with yes. food and you talk about vibrancy in vegetables and how like fresh dug vegetables have like this vibrancy as a chef and working with these vegetables can you speak into that a little bit more yeah you know when I I think about the vibrancy of veggies you know it's it's something that's really difficult to experience when the produce isn't fresh. You know, we when we go to most grocery stores, the veggies have been there for a while. I mean, we have massive distribution change in the United States, particularly. And, you know, they do the best that they can. Most grocery stores, you know, they try to, you know, have a really nice aesthetic and get the, the mist and the humidity just right. But you know, it, at some point it's so far removed from where it used to be that it's really difficult to get the same feeling as harvesting raspberries off of a bush and kind of feeling the sun-kissed nature of it and eating it while it's still kind of warm from just being in the environment rather than coming out of, you know, the plastic shell. And I mean, raspberry is delicious no matter what, but <laughs> at the same time, it just, that connection, that that visceral nature that food can have is so much more, uh, it's so much deeper mm -hmm. when we're able to experience it sort of in its environment. Like I, I think about wine a lot and the terroir and we talk about the soil and we talk about, you know, the different varieties of the grapes, but we don't romanticize food in the same way in a, in a lot of ways in our culture. So I think it's funny though, because that terroir, terroir is, everything in food it's not just yeah. grapes, you know so. that's such a good point and something you don't necessarily think about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that definitely is interesting when you think of tuar and like the effect it has on the mm -hmm. food have right. you been able to notice like regional differences or like growing differences or like can you describe that a little bit further yeah so when we think about regional variances in food. I, I think like I, I grew up on the East Coast. I'm mm -hmm. now in Northern Kentucky, very close to Cincinnati and Ohio. Uh, I can actually see Cincy from my backyard. And I think about like even the apple varietals, um, that obviously there are varieties that are the same. Mm -hmm. um, but when you think about the fact that they're grown in very different locations, and they're also grown by different people. It's, it's not just the soil, it's also the hands that are touching the food. 
Um, I, I think you can pick up on different variances in either texture or even aroma. Uh, you know, it's the little things, and it's it's difficult to catch that, particularly, you know, as, as a society we're purchasing a lot of food that's uh, grown on really big farms for the most part, and um, has spent a lot of time post harvest in you know trucks, and then in the grocery store, and then maybe hanging out in our fridge a little too long. You know, like it, there's a long length of time where the the nutrition starts to slowly deplete a little bit so we don't get that same vibrancy we don't get the idiosyncrasies that we may have from getting a carrot from one farmer versus another farmer um mm -hmm. but you can definitely tell even like the sweetness um a, a spring carrot versus a fall carrot can sometimes be very different just from that sweet level but also slightly texture uh, even shape if you want to look at that so uh there's there's a lot but you have to key in on it it's very difficult to notice unless you, you're mindful about that moment with your food yeah. yeah I I think I've said this on other podcasts but I was out with a farmer one time and he was talking about tasting um his herbs through the seasons mm -hmm. like throughout the season I guess yeah to taste like nuances every week in the herb and I'm like it's so interesting to think of like, you know, every week, every day, you mm -hmm. know, the flavors are just subtly changing depending on the weather, right. depending on the soil, you know, all the things. Yeah. But um, yeah, really cool. A note from our sponsor. The Chef's Garden is a family owned regenerative farm that grows the most flavorful and nutritious vegetables, herbs and microgreens for culinary professionals and home cooks. For over 30 years, the Chef's Garden has supplied some of the world's finest chefs and restaurants. Now, through Farmer Jones Farm, the same delicious ingredients are available to home cooks in the United States to use and enjoy, delivered directly to their homes. The Chef's Garden mission is to grow exceptional vegetables, care for each other and the land, and inspire a vegetable forward future. For more information, visit chefs-garden.com. So, as far as um, your journey to becoming a chef and your graduate work goes, can you tell me a little bit more about your graduate work and um, then also your work with Turner Farms and getting into teaching? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my graduate work, I just finished my doctorate in higher education leadership, but my research was on food insecurity in higher education institutions, which um, I think anybody who's experienced being a starving student probably understands on some level what that is like. Um, but it's something that a lot of people go, oh, it's temporary because, you know, you're, you're couch surfing, you're a college student, you know, you'll get get over it. But that's not the reality for a lot of folks. And the demographics within higher education have also drastically changed in the last few decades and financial resources have changed too. So it's a huge issue from a prevalence standpoint. Um, so that's really what I focused on. And then my master's, I focused actually on beer culture. So my master's in food studies from NYU. Uh, and I really loved looking at uh, different beer cultures and, and looking at sort of the American boom with the craft beer revolution. Uh, so that was really fun. Beverages have been a big part of my life. I used to work in the, the wine industry too, kind of along with cooking. Um, and it's, it's always funny thinking about the the anthropological and sociological like thread that I've always had with mm -hmm. any of my research. Um, but I, I felt much more at home with my graduate work in my doctorate level, uh, just because for me, that access, thinking about either, you know, my personal journey of having difficulty with connecting on that, that level of having enough food and being okay with that enough food, but also mm -hmm. the fact that some folks, you know, just don't have access because of how our society has done a lot of things to our food system and made it inaccessible and made food deserts. And it's a lot of things that are outside of individuals control. Uh, and it's something that we need to talk about as, as a society too. So um, it's also great to think about my graduate work too, and the fact that, you know, I, I'm at Escoffier and we do amazing work with a lot of students and uh, it's really helpful in seeing how our students progress through our program and uh, seeing what we can do to make their lives better, both both from a research standpoint, but also an educator standpoint. 
Um, and I, I started teaching actually, um, well, I, I used to do martial arts growing up and I was a teacher in high school basically because they were like, oh, we need additional assistance and you're here all the time. So I was unpaid, unpaid teacher, you know, <laughs> a high school yes. student. Uh, but it's super fun. I used to teach, you know, the four-year-olds that are starting off karate got kicked in the shins too many times, but you know, it's part of the process. Um, and I, I loved that community that I had there. Um, but I, I've always had this, uh, desire to want to teach and, and learn more within that process. I remember when I was super little, I was drawing, um, from out of a, a another book like a, ch a children's book but I was like copying the images so I could send it or give it to my classmates so they could also color in it oh, I just yeah and I had like an imaginary school that I would go to as a kindergartner I so for me education has been one of those things that's been very freeing for me and learning more information also learning that I will never know everything and it, it keeps me very excited about life um mm -hmm. so that's really why I kind of fell into teaching. I kind of forgot about it growing up. And then um, when I was in my undergraduate program uh, at the Culinary Institute of America, I have the opportunity of being a, I had a very long title, it was a food and student coordinator uh, for a pilot study. We were looking at pre-diabetic symptoms and how health and wellness principles could potentially reverse them. So uh, I got to be on sort of a managerial side, so I wasn't actually teaching, but I really fell in love with what we were doing uh, for those individuals and the, the program. Uh, so I was just so inspired that I stayed on uh, at the CAA as a teaching assistant or what they call them managers in training. So it's a little managerial, little teaching, a little bit of, little bit of this, a little bit of that. <laughs> it, it was nice, uh, you know, after an undergraduate program. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then I, I moved away from teaching for a little while while I was doing my master's and, uh, the opportunity at Turner Farm kind of naturally happened uh, through the network that I had created over the years and uh, got on a plane to cook for their board members. And uh, it's this amazing farm in Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, said yes to taking the job that weekend and moved out uh, here within a month. Uh, wow. It was great. Uh, Turner Farm is they're doing some really great things for the community. Um, they're an organic farm, but they also have a beautiful teaching kitchen. So I helped run it for about three years. And then I moved on uh, to Escoffier, but uh, really had such a great time teaching for both the community, but also we did a, a lot of work with the University of Cincinnati and doing some public uh, classes, really focusing on partnering medical professionals with a chef. So they do the didactic portion, really talk about whatever their focus was, either gut health or brain health. Then we get into the kitchen and we'd create some beautiful food that helps translate the research into things that are edible and actually apply apply that research. So I always really love that um, and just got an amazing opportunity at Escoffier that I, I couldn't pass up. So. <laughs> oh, that's so great. And I love that you're pairing medical professionals with chefs to actually mm -hmm. put it into practice. And I think that's oftentimes where the largest gap is, yeah. is there's a lot of like, eat better <laughs> advice going on in healthcare yes. without any direction of how. And even right. with, as medical professionals, most of us don't have any training in how to cook right. even for ourselves, let alone how to teach yeah. other people. So no, that's absolutely. an amazing and it's, collaboration. Yeah. And it's it's fascinating to me looking at the, the medical world and that, you know, nutrition education, even not even the cooking portion, just nutrition itself is such uh, sort of an undervalued portion of the curriculum. Oh gosh, it it yes. seems like they're starting to slowly change that, which is great and way overdue. Uh, but I think about even, you know, looking at RDs, not all of them have experience with the culinary arts. I remember, you know, when I was a teenager trying to refigure out how to re-eat, um, I went to a nutritionist once. I'm like, I, you know, I need to eat more. How do I mm -hmm. do that? And I just remember one of the most idiotic conversations I had was like, well, you could eat more chickpeas. I'm like, I know I could eat more chickpeas. But it was just like the most bizarre and unconnected yes. to the food. And I think that's that's really what we need to see more of is people collaborating, uh, chefs, medical professionals, RDs, um, all of us coming together and looking at how do, how do we get excited about food? How do we help other people get excited about food and healthy food? Because um, we're so disconnected in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. So 
And uh, yeah. I so share that when um, I, when I was younger, I struggled with anorexia mm-hmm. and when it was, I was seeing my doctor it was basically like, well, just eat anything, like just yeah. eat more. And it's yeah. like, it's not that simple. And right. like, what? But yeah, it was, <laughs> and that's, go ahead. <laughs> and my parents would be like, oh, well, we'll just go to the bakery and like get you donuts. And it's like, I, what? I like, I don't think that's the answer, you know? No. And, yeah. And it's, that's the thing though, is I, I think in a lot of ways, other folks are, are trying to help. And mm-hmm. obviously it is partially caloric in right. those situations, yeah. but at the same time, I, I think a lot of individuals that may go through to that, or at least with my experiences going through anorexia, it was very much focused on, I want to eat, but I, I don't want to feel terrible afterwards. Mm-hmm. Some of that is psycho psychological. Some of that is, is physical and not just consuming everything under the sun. That's not the right way either. And it's, it's very precarious for anybody yeah. trying to re renavigate their connection with food, whatever the situation is. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I think, Oftentimes in the medical profession, we see everything as calories, right? And there's so much more to food than calories. And I think when you think about like the phytonutrients and the color and the Mm -hmm. taste and Mm -hmm. like the experience of eating and even the emotions that come along with eating, um, I think it's just oversimplified. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And I, you know, I, I think in a lot of ways we've done that both in the medical world and just, you know, as a culture, because Mm -hmm. it's easier to understand but at the same time, when you take away the complexity, you miss that human portion of it. You you miss the emotional connection. You miss the community aspect of eating with other people and what that brings to the table as well. Um, thinking about the connection we could have to the growers mm-hmm. that are producing the food, because th- that makes us feel a different way about our food than something that's just served to us without any connection. Um, I think there's a lot of elements that are so important for us to understand so that we do have a deep connection with what we're consuming. But at the same time, I think it's really difficult for a lot of individuals to navigate that and then help other people navigate that because it's not simple. It never will be simple. It never should have been simple. (laughs) Right. Yes. That's one of my girlfriends actually teaches yoga for eating disorders, amazing. which is really amazing. And I think it's a really yeah. neat way to, way to integrate mm-hmm. um, like that mind and body connection. And mm-hmm. then along with the food piece and actually nourishing the body, right. um, I, I just think is really powerful. So yeah. yeah, hopefully we'll see the tides change there. As yeah. Far as yeah, absolutely. I think there drugs. are a lot more individuals who are keyed in on it now and um, we're getting there. We're yeah. not there yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your work with Escoffier and yeah. what you're doing there and the plant-based culinary arts program that you guys have as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, at Escoffier, I'm a lead chef instructor. So uh, I started off as a faculty member teaching in their culinary program. And over the years, we were working on uh, creating a plant-based program. So um, it's culinary focused, although we do have two uh, baking baking courses within it that are also plant-based and uh, just because you know trying to make it make vegan cake is a little bit different than a traditional yeah. french cake um still got sugar you know it's still unhealthy on some level but at the same time figuring out how to navigate substitutions you got to start mm-hmm. somewhere so uh i was working as a subject matter expert while also teaching and then i got an amazing opportunity to become a lead uh so i manage mostly. Uh, We have an amazing faculty in both our plant-based program. Well, all of our programs, our faculty are awesome. Uh, We would not be the same school and we would not have the same students without our faculty. Uh, So I've had the opportunity to oversee our plant-based programs. We have a diploma program as well as an associate's track. And then we also have our holistic nutrition program. So they're two separate programs, but obviously a lot of intersectionality between the two programs. So I'm happy that I get to oversee both since they're both big passions of mine. Um, and the plant-based program, they if you're doing the diploma track or the associates, you start with all of your culinary courses, uh, but do some business courses along the way. And then the diploma ends after finishing um, some cuisine classes. And if you do the associate level, then some general education courses. So that kind of rounds it out for that degree. I can imagine that your program now, especially with the H and W students, is a very different approach. And I imagine you have some vegans who aren't. Yeah, you know it's you it's know, interesting because you know we have 
Yeah, absolutely. So we have our whole plant-based program, uh, which is amazing. And obviously we have a lot of different classes that help you dig in at different aspects of being plant-based. And then the H&W program still does have some animal product in it. We're happy to work with substitutions and things like that, but there is one week in their first culinary foundations course, because it's a classic culinary foundations with chicken fabrication. Mm. And unfortunately, there's really no other substitute for animal fabrication. You, know, you do fish fabrication instead of chicken, but yeah. breaking down butternut squash is not quite the same thing. And, yeah. you know, I, I love our plant-based program, but if you don't know if you're only going to cook for plant-based folks, there's also something to be said about learning those skills Mm -hmm. to help cook for other people because health and wellness looks different for everybody. My favorite saying is nobody's body is the same. Everybody's body is different. And what's going to work for one person is not going to work for another person. So we need to know how to cook in a lot of different ways to be able to help people feel the best for themselves. And uh, so that that week can be quite challenging for a lot of folks. Like I, I remember doing um, our meat fabrication class uh, was three weeks long for, for my program. And uh, it was definitely an out of body experience for some of like, I had worked in kitchens before going there and, you know, I took care of chickens at that farm too. It's not like it was the first time being around animal products in a long time, but um, you know, you have that psychological moment of going, I'm deconstructing an animal like it's it's an interesting psychological moment for a lot of folks i don't think it's just people who are vegan or vegetarian but then being able to honor and and try to do the best that you possibly can to use everything that that animal has has lived for and given uh, i think there's something really um honoring about that as well um yeah. so I, there's a way way to do it but it's, it's not for everybody <laughs> yeah oh my gosh that's so interesting I love your perspective on that though and I think it really honors everyone's individuality and mm -hmm. that's so valuable yeah yeah it's you know it's it's interesting because I think um like like fabrication I everybody's gonna have a different viewpoint on food that's what makes it so magical and wonderful mm -hmm. is that uh, we're all going to feel a different way. Even if we like the same things, we may feel differently inherently about it. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But I, I think it's really important that, especially as chefs and as educators and consumers, that um, we're aware that not everybody is going to feel the same way. And that's okay. Um, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. It's more about, so where do we find the middle ground? Or how do I help you achieve what you want to achieve? Like that's, and I think it's important just to open up that conversation of the different yeah. perspectives too, because yeah. we learn so much just by listening to, you yeah. know, different points of view. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, you know, I think about the H and W folks, and um, our students are so awesome. They're so cool. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and some folks are like, you know, bodybuilders, and they've got that perspective going to H and W, and then we've got the. Uh, I hate to say it this way, but hardcore vegans, like we have a lot of different viewpoints. And yeah. I think that's what makes it so enriching is that they're looking at food through a health lens, but that lens is still very different, you know, on a spectrum. And I think mm -hmm. that's the beautiful thing about like I, one of my personal uh, enjoyment portions of research is looking at Eastern Asian medicines and looking at how food, food is medicine uh, looks in like Ayurvedic versus East Asian, uh, East Asian, um, you know, traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, and it's, you know, f food is so important, but it means something totally different in just those two examples, let alone our whole world, you know? Um, and I, I think some folks think about health as this one identity, this one avenue, but it's not. It, it so is not. Um, so I, I love that our students are so diverse so that we can have those conversations. Yeah. Yeah. But we start with foundations, you know, knife skills, the food safety, sanitation uh, in our first course. And then we have two other uh, foundation courses where we talk about stocks and soups, grains and legumes. We talk about plant-based proteins, stews, stir fries, all of the different types of techniques and the products that you would see more heavily in plant-based uh, than traditional. Uh, from there, we have the uh, baking and pastry courses. So we have two of those. All of our courses are six weeks long. So it's really 
kind of fast and furious, which is very um, akin to our industry. Um, right. And then from there, we move on to uh, plant-based and seasonal cuisine. So every single week of that six-week block is a different season. So they really get to see kind of a whole year life cycle of what what seasonal dishes could look like. Obviously, there are many other dishes, but um, that curriculum also looks at sustainability and different farming practices. So that's really a very cool course. And then we have uh, plant-based approaches to wellness. And we talk about a lot of different diets uh, and how some of them intersect with um, plant-based cooking. So like our second week of that course looks at whole foods, plant-based cooking, um, which, you know, is, is amazing and, and all about whole foods, uh, but very different than just being vegan, you know, mm -hmm. Oreos are still vegan. That's, right. <laughs> it's not the same thing. So, you know, we, we talk through a lot of different um, diets, Ayurvedic, macrobiotic, um, just so that students have an understanding kind of of that breadth of the many different ways that you could consume plant-based because there's not one, one way to eat plant-based. Very similarly, there's not one way to eat in general. Yes. And I think you know, that's really yeah. important to distinguish because oftentimes yeah. like being vegan can right. signal like that it's healthful, but right. depending on kind of the spectrum of where you're oh, at yes. can depend on kind of how many health benefits there are. Oh, definitely. <laughs> and it's like pasta's vegan. It doesn't mean yeah. you should be eating pasta every day. I, I love pasta, but yeah. <laughs> it's also one of the things we we want to eat a variety of different veggies and fruits, grains and legumes. You know, that's the that's way we can get the most nutrient dense uh, mm -hmm. dishes and, and make sure that we feel vibrant because for if you're eating the same thing over and over again, at some point, you are not going to feel good, even if you felt great the first time. <laughs> Exactly. I uh, think that diversity in your um, yeah. repertoire of what you can eat is so important. And then you don't end up yeah. with the mineral or vitamin deficiencies, right? Because right. you're eating a wide variety. Right. Well, and that's the thing, too, is when we think about folks who are trying to eat healthy, you know, I, I think about um, particularly individuals who are focusing on like macrobiome, their macros. Mm -hmm. And then it turns into it, not plant based, but, you know, like protein a grain and some veggies and it's just forever the the trifecta and just yeah. kind of rotating in these plastic containers <laughs> just, right. it's, at some point that's not fun <laughs> i don't know if it was fun to begin with for most people <laughs> but they were at least dead. <laughs> so I, that's the thing is food can be fun food can be colorful uh eat, cooking i know for not everybody is super exciting and can uh, hold a lot of negative emotion for folks too because uh Cooking is not something most individuals have grown up with. It's it's not mm -hmm. a skill most people naturally have. Uh, it's something you need to coax and learn. Um, whether or not you want to become a professional chef or just cook for yourself and your family home, that's totally cool too. Um, it's it's a skill and it it's a lifetime skill. It's not something you become good at overnight. Uh, and I think for a lot of folks, that's it's daunting. So it becomes easy to cook the same thing over again because you know it mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, exciting every time so yeah um, i love that we get to uh show students an abundance of different dishes and uh, get them hopefully really excited about product knowledge and uh, different veggies that they can get their hands on um, yeah I love that and, you say cooking yeah. can be fun because <laughs> I think oftentimes, especially when it comes to healthy cooking, mm -hmm. people associate like rice cakes and overly mm -hmm. steamed broccoli with like healthy food, right? right? Or like, I don't know what else, but um, to think of it as fun and tasty and delicious mm -hmm. and, you know, all of the things that um, just with a little time and like attention, it can be really amazing and full of joy and vibrancy and all of the yeah. things. And I think that's, that's the thing is for a lot of folks that think about cooking at cooking at home, um, mm -hmm. you know, many people may not be comfortable in their kitchen, either for knife skill purposes or maybe even food safety or not knowing what to cook first, but also maybe not knowing how to work with spices or create, you know, an herb sauce to put on top of it. So there, there are a lot of things that are very small that can make our food way more uh, in, impactful to our palate and also to us in general. But uh, I think sometimes we get so overwhelmed 
with the possibilities in a kitchen that it becomes really difficult to hone in. And even young chefs thinking about the dishes, uh, even the dishes that I used to put, I have a little notebook, I'm looking around for, for it somewhere. But I some of the dishes that I was like, oh, I'm going to make this, it's going to be great. It was so unedited. There were too many spices or it was like all over the place because I just, just wanted everything in one dish, which is impossible. <laughs> but it's taking that time to really hone in and create something that is both complex in flavor, but simplistic is not an easy skill. And it takes years to develop that. So, um, you know, it, it's not what most people are thinking of when they're trying to make dinner for the family, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's such a good point to make because oftentimes you do get where you're like, oh, some of the recipes you see on Pinterest mm -hmm. or whatever, like, oh, mm -hmm. this has 25 different ingredients. Yeah. <laughs> like, maybe right? that's a little bit excessive. <laughs> yeah. I know there are times when it's spices, if you're making your own curry blend, I can kind of see that. But yeah. there are other times where like, thing in there, not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. yes. So when it comes to like your favorite vegetable forward meal that you maybe cook for yourself, yeah. what right now are you enjoying? Uh, you know, so it's, it just snowed four inches yesterday. So I'm definitely feeling the root veg, hearty, hearty grain. Uh, last night I had made a curried, uh, mung dal dish. Mm. Um, so I soaked some mung dal beans and then did some curry powder and turmeric, bloomed it in a little bit of fat and then added in, um, onions, garlic, ginger, uh, a little bit of tomato paste. And then from there, added in the soaked mung, mung dal with uh, some veggie stock that I had at home. And then also a little bit of coconut milk and let it uh, simmer, topped it off with some scallions. So and paired it with uh, just some rice. So for me, I just hearty warming dishes in the winter. Always great. Um, yeah. I threw in some sweet potatoes and cauliflower, too, just to give it a little bit more textural variance and also some nutrient density <laughs> besides the beans and the rice. Um, but every so often too, I really like doing grain bowls. I, I feel like they had a big boom on Pinterest mm -hmm. a while back, but it's great because it's not one, one thing. Like I think of, you can make it with farro, you can do it with quinoa, you can roast, like I have acorn squash that I'll probably roast off later and sear off some Brussels sprouts, maybe add in some pickled carrots. And you've got really a, a lot of different colors and you're using whatever you have or whatever is in season. So it's more about the idea of a grain bowl than a specific one. Um, Cause I think some folks are like, oh, well, it's quinoa salad yet again. And <laughs> quinoa salad is lovely, but not every day. <laughs> right. so those are two-ish two, two -ish dishes <laughs> right now. I love that. And they're easy and you can even mm -hmm. meal prep though. It's like do oh, yeah. them ahead or have the ingredients ready to go and do different mm -hmm. variations. Totally, totally. And that's the thing too, is uh, that cooking at home, it's kind of similar in cooking at kitchens where you know, you're just making a lot more and the way you prep is a little bit different in kitchens because you're trying to speed up the time to cook. But arguably, most people want that at home, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you can, you know, do a lot of your knife work in advance and have everything labeled so that when you go to cook, you're really just putting it either on a sheet tray or sauteing it off in a pan. It becomes much easier if you do a lot of um, pre-thinking and pre-prep. I like to call it my mental mise en place of thinking through the dishes that I want to make for the week and then also thinking, okay, I just bought a bunch of sweet potatoes. So I'm going to make these four different dishes that are completely different, but I'm going to use up all of that. That way I'm not wasting my food, but I'm also not eating the same thing over and over again. So mm -hmm. there's definitely a way to do it, but it definitely also takes some practice. And skill. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to seasonal eating, mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts as far as a chef goes, but also <laughs> when it comes to health and wellness, what are your thoughts around seasonality and seasonal eating? So I think seasonal eating is really important for a lot of different reasons. Um, one is that nu nutrient density, you're eating it in season, eating it hopefully locally as well. So it's not traveling as far. Um, I think our bodies also, also kind of naturally need what's in season to help us thrive within that season. Um, so also thinking about seasonality sort of as a chef, uh, there's a lot of different varieties. Like I, I just picked up some beets yesterday or the day before, but you know, the red beets versus golden beets versus candy stripe. There's so many different varieties and um, that there's so much abundance in what's in season, even in the winter. And I think a lot of folks go, oh, it's just root veg. 
like, oh, well, you know, there's, there's also some really beautiful, um, you know, cauliflower, cabbage, you know, for Brussels sprouts versus a Napa cat. There are so many other variations. It's not just like carrots and potatoes. Like that's, that's not all that's there. And even think about carrots and potatoes. You, how many varieties are there of each of those? And they all have a different texture. I have a different size. You can prepare them differently. Like the way I would prepare a fingerling potato versus an Idaho potato, drastically different. And you're going to end up with a drastically different product. So there's a lot that you can do with seasonal produce and having that creativity and, and finding a spark that I think sometimes when you start pulling fruits and veggies out of season, A, they've traveled a really long way. It's not the most sustainable thing to do either. It, it just doesn't taste the same. But at the same time, if you're eating in season, it also helps you kind of narrow in. So we're talking about editing our, <laughs> editing yeah. our dishes. Um, using what's in season can help you do that without restricting you know, mm -hmm. but it's, it's taking the time to know what's in season for your area. And it's different everywhere. There are microclimates. Um, and also thinking about, you know, outdoor growing, this is indoor growing, uh, Cincinnati, while it's freezing cold in the winter, you can still grow lettuces inside. Um, you know, there are amazing hoop houses that keep it warm enough that you can grow that. So, um, learning, learning about different growing practices can help also open up what actually is in season. So, um, that was sort of a long, elongated, circly. That was answer, perfect. But... <laughs> and I love that you bring up sustainability. And I mm -hmm. like to think about wasted food. And mm -hmm. Chef Ismail uh, Samed, I did a mm -hmm. podcast with him a while back, and he mm -hmm. talked about how he doesn't like to talk about food waste. He likes to talk about wasted food, like mm -hmm. the semantics of that. And I think yeah. it's really powerful to say it differently. Um, as wasted food. So when it comes to wasted food and reducing mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts as a chef, but also as an educator? Yeah, you know, when, when we're looking at wasted food, I mean, that's, I think the statistic lately is a third of all food produced um, goes to waste, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Think about all of the effort that individuals have put into growing it, and then the amount of individuals that are impacted in that chain that have just lost you know potential revenue and also but you know i, I just it it's mind-blowing to me that we've gotten to this point but at the same time it makes sense from a globalization standpoint and how we, how we got here makes sense when we're looking back but we have to find a different way in the mm -hmm. in the future and right now actually um so when i think about wasted food as a chef or even at home i'm everybody's got the lettuce in the back of their fridge that they forgot about you know, it's, it's the shame spinach. Like, it's, it's there. It's, it's gotten a little sad. Um, so I think pre I'm going to remember that. <laughs> um, I think pre-planning and, and thinking through what you plan on eating, you don't have to follow a strict regimen. I think that it can also be uh, not great for a lot of individuals, but kind of knowing what you plan on cooking can help you minimize what you're buying kind of on a whim. Um, and also planning out those dishes can help you go, okay, so I'm going to use um, these Brussels sprouts in these three different dishes. So I am not uh, leaving any out and not forgetting about it for two weeks. And then you have the sad, wilted, shriveled you know, baby Brussels. Uh, it's just, it's sad. And, you know, as a chef, I think about all the food costs, just kind of running it through my head. But at the same time, it's, it's food that you bought. You worked hard to purchase that and then you're not consuming it. It that seems so counterintuitive. It's just it's it's frivolous in a lot of ways. But right. um, you know, so planning ahead can definitely help so that when you go to the grocery store, you're not just buying what looks good. Although that can sometimes be helpful as well because you're buying whatever looks the most vibrant or you know looks the most attractive, but then also having a plan. So if you do go off script a little bit, off of your plan, that's totally cool, but then have a plan for it. Think through how are you going to use it so that you don't end up with, you know, your, your ginger root in the back of your, you know, fridge too. Um, you can also freeze ginger root. It's lovely. And then you can grate it. So there are ways to, if you buy too much, you're like, oh shoot, what do I do with this now? You know, ginger's great to freeze, but then you could also think about uh, maybe I'll make a large batch of soup and then freeze off some of the soup so you can reheat it later. So there's always ways to, you know, 
make up for a mistake in a lot of ways. I, I think kitchens are, are great for that because it's, it's a lot of creativity and going, oh, we overbought or um, the distributor accidentally sent us XYZ. So let's, let's figure out a way to use it and figure out a way to make it delicious. So uh, I think in a lot of ways, some folks can be more creative with what they purchase at home too. Uh, and the other thing too is thinking you know, that plan, but also when you go to do prep, so say you're making dinner tonight, if you have extra onion, dice the onion, put it in a container, label and date it, and then it's ready to go for the next day. That way you're always kind of ahead of your prep too, so it's not as daunting. So I think in a lot of ways, it's it's all about that planning. For me, that that's the big way around, at least at home, planning is the way to remove wasted food. Uh, obviously, there's there's still some idiosyncrasies and maybe a potato um, ran away from you and now it's got eyes. You, you arguably could plant it, but most people are not going to do that. So there's, there's always creative things you can do. <laughs> yeah. A message from our sponsor. Farming for Health is brought to you by Farmer Jones Farm at the Chef's Garden. Farmer Jones Farm provides nutritious, regeneratively grown vegetables to home cooks nationwide. If you are searching for vegetables grown in a way that's healthy for you and good for the planet, try a curated box from Farmer Jones Farm. Get 15% off your order with the code FARMINGFORHEALTH15. When it comes to leftovers, mm -hmm. what are your ideas around utilizing leftovers? Oh, I, I love leftovers because you can give it a new life. It can be totally different. Um, like thinking about grains. So if you have leftover, say farro, um, you could then make it into, uh, you know, fried farro or, you know, instead of fried rice, it's fried farro, or you could add it to a stew to make it more uh, hearty. There, there's always things you can do with ingredients. I think the key thing is thinking about uh, how you're storing the leftovers and also making sure that it cools down properly. So you're not <laughs> dealing with anything that could potentially be hazardous, but uh, if you store things kind of individually, so I think about those grain bowls. We have the grain separate, maybe we made a dressing, maybe we prepped out our veggies and uh, seared some off or roasted some. If you keep them separately, then you can use them separately in future dishes rather than throwing everything together. And then you're like, oh, well, I have this. <laughs> and uh, nobody wants to pick through prep. I'm like, no, nobody wants to do that. So for me, uh, that's a big part of it is uh, keeping the the prepped ingredients that are cooked kind of separate when when I go to store them so that I can individually give them new lives. Uh, that way you're not eating the same thing over again. <laughs> yes, I love that tip. And I think that's a great tip for people with children too. Mm -hmm. I love um, the website Solid Starts and they talk mm -hmm. about getting kids to eat actual whole foods and like get them into building kind of their own meals and developing yeah. their tastes. And one of the things they talk about is like, if you're having tacos, serving the individual like components of the meal and yeah. letting the kids kind of like build Choose. their yeah. meal. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense too, though, for as a, like being able to reuse the ingredients in other ways mm -hmm. afterwards. Yeah. I love that. And that's the thing too, is reusing it and, and giving choice. So if you're mm -hmm. in a larger home, especially with kids, I mean, giving them the option of going, oh, that looks really good. And that looks really good. Um, rather than, you know, having everything together and then just discounting the whole thing because they don't like the want, you know, like the parsley in it or whatever, whatever the right. case is. I mean, yes. adults are that way too. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I think it, it, it sort of empowers your household to be able to, to leverage what you've already started working on. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I know you've done some work with the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative too. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I was a chef advisory uh, member when I was at Turner Farm. Uh, okay. My kind of membership was uh, contingent with my employment there. Uh, but the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative is amazing. There are so many individuals that are part of it. Uh, and essentially, it's a nonprofit uh, these days. Um, it didn't start that way, but they finally got their 501c3. So okay. I'm super excited for them. Uh, and it's a larger consortium of teaching kitchens and uh, individuals uh, and organizations that are looking at, you know, food as medicine and finding a way to reintroduce cooking into communities, um, both from a medical perspective, but also from just a public health perspective. So uh, there are a lot of different players that are part of the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative, a lot of universities, Google's a part of it. There, there are a lot of big names, but there's also YMCA's, 
uh, Turner Farm is a part of it. So there, you know, it's it's a big epicenter, essentially, at least the way I think about it, of individuals who are really passionate about helping other people learn how to cook and reconnecting them to food and helping them feel better and helping communities feel better. So uh, ultimately, it's all about healing. Then that's that's really what the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative is about. Uh, Dr. David Eisenberg is their uh, founder. He's an amazing individual um, and, and has really helped uh, make the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative as as big and robust as it is now. Um, yeah, so while I was um, doing the advisory uh, kind of position there, uh, basically we would look at Teaching Kitchen uh, curriculum across sites and talk through, you know, what what's the best way for us to teach this? How should the flow of classes be for this type of population? So we, we really talk through different dish creations, but also curriculum, which I loved. Um, they're, they're amazing. They're doing great work. Um, so it's, it's always great to talk about them. <laughs> yeah. One of the things you mentioned was that the cooking industry is fast and furious. And I know you are passionate about self-care in the culinary industry. So can you talk to me about self-care and what you recommend for young chefs or aspiring chefs and chefs who have been in the business and are getting burnt out and tired and maybe haven't been attending to their self-care? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, yeah, like I said, the, the industry is very fast and furious. I think um, in a lot of ways, this industry also attracts individuals who maybe have the all or nothing um, perspective on life, which I'm very much a part of. <laughs> uh, but it's it becomes very easy to lean into work and think about work perpetually or think about the food and the passion behind it. And you just kind of like revel in it uh and then it becomes so easy to forget about caring for your body caring for your mental health caring about your relationships that you have outside of work uh it spirals really quickly um and i think that can happen in any industry it's just for the hospitality industry we work really long hours we tend to be very dedicated to um, the well-being of other people Mm -hmm. really forward on thinking about how can we make this experience the best for other people which is amazing. And I love that part of our industry. Uh, but sometimes there's that dark shadow of never inwardly looking on how can I make this better for myself as well. I think the industry is starting to slowly change. I think um, the fact that a lot of folks have kind of come forward with uh, the fact that our industry in a lot of ways is not sustainable from uh, a working hour perspective, uh, pay rate perspective, uh, you know, just benefits in general with kitchens and not just small businesses, but even larger companies thinking about um, sick leave and and what that looks like for individuals, both in the kitchen, but also front of the house and think about all of the other uh, positions that are part of the hospitality industry. Uh, It's our industry kind of needs an overhaul uh, in a lot of ways. Um, But I do think that at least for me, I've always found that it's really important to consider the individual self and where you're at in that whole cosm, but also thinking about what can you help improve in your own life uh, with what's around you uh, and the resources that you may have or that you can't have. So for my my big tip is um, don't forget about yourself. It's really easy. Um, and that's way easier said than done. Uh, but that that's my big tip is always checking in, even if it's what am I grateful for today? Uh, that's that's a great check-in because it helps you kind of slow down and, and think about what is happening around in your life. Uh, maybe it's something small. Maybe you're grateful for the sunshine. That is awesome. We shouldn't be grateful for the sunshine. Right. It's an amazing thing. <laughs> but it can be that small. It does not have to be, you know, in, incredibly um, articulate or the most in-depth analysis of your life and what you're grateful for in your existence it can just be i'm I'm grateful that i woke up that's awesome amazing uh and i think that's something that a lot of people don't do but i think it's something that's really important particularly when you're going hard in the paint as i would like to say with the industry and uh, perpetually on your feet uh don't forget to hydrate too i think that's my other tip is that it's very easy to forget to do that um and my probably my third tip for self-care is honestly um, checking in with other people 
that you care about because uh, I think everybody struggles in their own way and some people struggle more silently than others and it can go a long way just to say you know I'm thinking of you how are you Mm -hmm. you know so uh, those are my three hopefully basic tips (laughs) those are great tips I think that's a great place to start for sure Mm -hmm. Um, so our podcast is called Farming for Health. When we talk about Farming for Health, what does that bring to mind for you? You know, it, it brings a lot to mind. Uh, and I think it's in, in a lot of ways and not in a negative way loaded. Uh, but yeah. when I think of farming, uh, you know, I, yeah, obviously it's about growing. It's it's about the production of, of vital life in, in a way. But I also think that there's something to be said about farming when it comes to digging and thinking about the connection you have to the soil, to your communities around you. So you're, you're not just farming to grow something physical, you're growing your community around you, you're growing yourself, you're, you're deepening your spirit. Um, so for me, I think that's a big part of also health because I think a lot of people think, oh, I wanna be healthy. And it's like this stagnant mm-hmm. idea, but it's perpetually evolving. Um, you, healthy can mean one thing in one moment healthy can mean another thing uh in five minutes later there's nothing wrong with that but it's this perpetual evolution uh so i like to think about it as the perpetual evolution of communities so that's how i'm gonna sit I (laughs) i think that's great so where can our listeners go to find you online yeah so escafier's website is e s c o f f i e r dot edu um my bio is on there as well as all the other amazing faculty members um if anybody wants to reach out uh, probably through scoffier will be the fastest but um really cool program so i hope people check them out if you're interested and uh love to catch up with anybody if if they want to awesome well thank you so much for being a guest on the farming for health podcast today oh it's been my pleasure thank you for listening to farming for health we hope that you enjoyed this episode Connect with Farmer Lee Jones and I on Instagram and Facebook.